That's the most remarkable combination of things there in Isaiah chapter 33, verse 14. Uh, hypocrites and sinners. That's one verse. And then two questions. The sinners and the hypocrites have asked these two questions. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who's going to live with everlasting flame? That's the question. Talk about hell. And the question is, who in the world could stand that? Who could, who could, who could stand to live forever in devouring flame and everlasting fire? Read it. Read it. Isaiah 33, verse 14. Fearful to surprise the hypocrites, the sinners, who among us shall dwell in the devouring flame, everlasting fire. See that thing? Now look at the next verse. Nobody here will fulfill that. That's talking about works. That's an Old Testament passage. That Old Testament passage is talking about the way out of hell being living a perfect life. But I'll tell you right now, nobody lives a perfect life. You're not under the Old Testament. You're under the New Testament. And Jesus Christ has come and showed God's righteousness. And the Bible says, they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves the rights of God for Christ and the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. So you're not going to make it. And that thing there asked the question, who will dwell with everlasting fire and devouring flame and everlasting burnings? And the answer is, uh, nobody can stand that. Nobody can stand that. They'll go crazy. They'll go crazy. I'm going to talk to you one of that about five surprises you're going to get when you get to hell. Now, I hope you don't go to hell. And when I say that, I mean it sincerely. I hope you don't ever know what it's like to get there. But as sure as you live and breathe, some of you here tonight, somebody, Somewhere in this building tonight is going to wind up in hell. The congregation this size these days are bound to be one or two, sometimes three or four, sometimes more, is going to wind up in hell. And they're all over this town, all over the city, all over the world, all over the country. We had a missionary conference recently, and a missionary, a missionary affair over there. That missionary affair, you saw the little stand there representing people from various countries. And the truth is, in those countries represented there, there are millions, millions, millions going to hell. In Mexico, millions, not hundreds of thousands, millions. In Germany, millions. In China, millions, maybe billions. In Japan, India, Cambodia, Vietnam, millions. In the Philippines, millions. Germany, Spain, Italy, France, millions. Somebody's going to hell. Now, I'm going to take for granted that somebody here tonight is going to go to hell no matter what I say and how I handle it. And I'm going to warn you ahead of time what's going to happen. I'm going to talk to you about five surprises you're going to get when you get into hell. Now, the first surprise you're going to get when you get in there is you're going to be surprised to find that it really exists. You see, all your life you've heard it joked about and ridiculed and denied. And the greatest shock on earth is going to be when you get there and suddenly realize the place is there. Well, get the hell out of here. What the hell are you doing here? What the hell do you want? Who the hell do you think you are? And you hear that so much after. Why do you get used to it? You think hell's up an expression, folks, you may get mad. Boy, you're in for a shock. You're in for a shock. The first shock you're going to get is to find the places there. You heard it ridiculed. Out there in Las Vegas, they have a club called Hell Incorporated. That's in the corporation's paper. It's a nightclub called Hell Incorporated. And they got signs advertising outside Las Vegas that say, the road to hell is fun. You'll enjoy hell. <laughs> no, you won't enjoy hell. But you've heard it joked about, laughed about so much and denied so much that after a while you could think it's not there. Uh, Billy Graham recently and, uh, was quoted by all kinds of press releases by saying that the more he studied the matter, he had come to the conclusion that, that hell wasn't actually a literal fire. It was just separation from God. That's a bad blunder in Billy's part. All unsaved people are separated from God. On this earth right now, you've got over three billion people separated from God. But not in hell. And some are enjoying themselves. Some of them are glad they are separated from God. That isn't the picture. The picture is a furnace of fire. You're taking your Bible, you get to Matthew chapter 13. You know what it says in Matthew chapter 13? It says, the field is the world. Definition. The wheat is the children of the kingdom. Definition. The tares are the children of the wicked ones. Definition. The angels are the reapers. Definition. The harvest, the end of this world, definition. The fire is, it's fire. 
So it shall be at the end of this world. The angels shall come forth and sever the way from under the just and cast them to the furnace of fire. And what's the furnace of fire? It's the furnace of fire. That's Jesus Christ talking. Jesus Christ said, this means this, and this means this, and this means this, and this means this, and fire means F-I-R-E, fire. Billy Graham said, no, it doesn't mean you're wrong, Billy. You're wrong. Sorry, old buddy, you're wrong. You're just as wrong as you can be. Jesus Christ said, fire is fire. But you hear it uh, joke about so much, after all, you kind of think that maybe there's nothing to it. H.G. Wells, you know what he said one time? H.G. Wells said, when I was 25 years old, I had the idea of hell blasts out of my mind forever. But the word occurs 60 times in his writings. After he was 50, you didn't get it blasted out too well, did J.G. Wells? All is well, there is no hell. No, you get those jokes about it. A fellow says, well, you know, uh, heaven for, co- for climate and hell for company. Big joke, see, big joke. When you get to hell, you won't like the company. The first shock you're going to get is it's there. You see, way down in your heart, really and truly, you never thought the place was actually little. But it's going to show up. I got a friend up there in, uh, in uh, Canton, Ohio, and he had another friend he'd been praying for for years and hoping the guy would get saved. And one night he got a telephone call from the fellow, and the fellow said, uh, guess what, Jim, I just got saved. He said, you did, praise the Lord. He said, well, uh, you want to have me come over? He said, yeah, we're having an Anway party at my place tonight. I want you to have about this Amway. This Amway is the greatest stuff you ever saw. And he talked for 10 minutes about Amway over the telephone. And this friend of mine said, you're not saved. Anybody who goes around like that over Amway right after this got saved, you're not saved. But a fellow gets saved, you know, the first thing that strikes him? Let me tell you, the first thing that strikes a when he gets saved is, my God, I've been fooled all my life. These other people must be fooled. That's the first thing that strikes him. The first thing you got you when you got saved, got your eyes open, you thought, oh, my God, my mom and daddy are lost. Right? Yes, sir. Or my wife or my husband. What? The first thing that hits you when you got saved was these people are lost. By getting your eyes open the first time. You don't say, oh, come to the Amway party. No, you don't. No, you don't. All right, the first shock you're going to get is going to put the fact that it's there. And the next shock you're going to get is the fact that you got there so fast. You got there so quick. A fellow said one time, how far away is hell? And a fellow said, just a step away. Will you take the step? Did you ever see those signs that say, uh, step down, please? You're going to step down, some of you. You're going to be amazed how fast you got there. You never realized it'd be that fast. There's so many roadblocks to hell that you wouldn't think you could have got there as quick as you got. But when you get there, if you get there this year or next year, you'll be amazed how quick it was. God Almighty has set up roadblocks all the way to keep you out of hell and keep you from going there. They set up all the way. There's the church. There's the Bible. There's sermons. There's prayer. There's the Holy Spirit. There's Calvary. If you ever go to hell, you'll have to fight like a mad dog to get there. At least in America. In America, a man that goes to hell in America is in terrible condition. But every church and every street corner is, is a warning. Even the even the even the, the counterfeits, the Jehovah Witness, the Mormons, the Seventh Day Adventists, the, all these pagan churches. Still, the church right there is a reminder. See, that is a steeple that points up. See, it's a reminder. If they don't preach, they give the fellow there unsaved preaching the social economy. It's a reminder, and that is no somebody's praying for you. That's a roadblock. And that is no sermons are being preached. Whether you hear them on radio or not, they're being preached on radio. They're being preached on television. The sermons, that, what are those things? Those are roadblocks to hell. Uh, people praying for the Holy Spirit to roadblock to hell. The Holy Spirit is in the world today. He's not through convicting of sin, rights, and judgment yet. He's been convicting of sin, rights, and judgment for nearly 2,000 years. He's not through yet. And if you go to hell, you have to fight him. You have to whip him to get to hell. Sam Jones talked about a camp meeting I had one time, that camp meeting. He said, there was a fellow there, everybody been praying for for years, had a fine Christian wife. And the fellow came to the camp meeting, rough old backwoodsman. He came to the camp meeting, they said, a little shack there, the, the thrown up for the, a little lean to for the camp meeting. And one night after a terribly a terrific sermon by some fellow in hell with the power of God was just shaking the place to pieces, they approached that man about his soul and he said, I've got to think about it. 
And he went back in that lean-to and went in there by himself and slammed the door. And his wife and kids stayed outside and prayed for him all night. And a bunch of preachers gathered around that place and prayed all night. And about 7 o'clock in the morning, that fellow came out of that, that uh, shack. And he came out of that shack, Sam Jones said, you could take one look at his face and tell that he'd, that fellow had won. He'd beat God out. His face was just as hard and cold as a double-bladed axe. He whipped the Holy Spirit. You don't have to do that to get to hell. You have to beat God out. God deals with people and tries to get them to trust Christ. If you get around him, you, you, you beat God out. If you're going by a roadblock. Out in Shawnee, Oklahoma, one time, several years back, a terrible thing happened. A uh, bunch of guys, just a practical joke, a bunch of teenagers, you know, trying to do something funny. Decided to remove a stop sign from an intersection that went from a small highway out on the main highway, and they removed it at night. And that night, a little bit later, a preacher got out of his uh, 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 pulpit and started taking his kids into the town by another direction. He didn't often drive in, and drove through there and came out across that place, and there wasn't any stop sign there, and drove out. And he had four of his family killed right off the bat, and uh, had two children in intensive care. Wife, he was killed, four of his kids were killed, and two of his kids were in intensive care, and his wife had both arms legged and both, both legs arm broken and both arms broken. Big funny joke. You see what? Removing the roadblock. Removing the roadblock. There are people in this world that are removing the warning, the Holy Spirit, against, uh, against going to hell. You're trying to get them out of the way. If you'd be amazed you got there so fast, and especially if some of you had good intentions, Sam Jones said the back of the other day of the Civil War, he knew of a case where a young fellow there had a he had a, an older brother, and both of them were in action. And they hadn't seen each other separated by some of his regiments for a while. And then he said, finally, this younger brother got news his older brother was dying in a kind of a makeshift uh, first aid station, which back in those days were a terror. They had arms and legs, big piles of arms and legs outside of them, feet and hands amputated with saws, you know. And half the patients died under it. The ones that got through, you know, just up there looking at their piles of arms and legs piled up. And he, he heard about his brother being terribly sick and dying. And he went to the place where the, his brother was and came there. And they were all a bunch of men all just thrown together, lying on top of each other practically in kind of a shed. And it was a long running shed with a fireplace of one of the things. Middle of winter, freezing cold. And he came to his brother and tried to talk to his brother about getting saved. His brother would just roll and toss and say, I'm hurt now, I can't talk to you. Partner, I can't talk to you. Let me talk to you just a minute, he said. He said, no, later, later, later. I'll talk to you tomorrow. I'll talk to you in the morning. But I'll talk to you tomorrow in the morning. But I'll talk to you tomorrow morning. So he got him in an army roll there and unrolled his bedroll and lay down beside his brother. Lay down beside his brother there at night and slept and he had a dream. And he dropped in the middle of the night that uh, that place got real quiet and all of a sudden he heard something. He looked over and he saw his brother open his mouth. And when he opened his mouth, he said something came out of his mouth. It looked like a soul. And that soul began to look up and down that shed in a panic, like a soul was in a panic. And then he said that soul went to the fireplace and then ran over to a bed and then ran over a bunk and then ran up the ceiling and then ran around behind some logs and hid under some logs in the fireplace. And he said about a second later, the door opened and in came a huge, shaggy-looking man in a black coat and a black hat. Walked around there looking around. He went over this body of this poor lion, his mouth open. He looked down at his mouth. Couldn't find it looking for. And he said he went around there and began to pick up blankets and pick up bedrolls and pick up logs and things to look around. And he said he heard that soul scream. And that huge shaggy man reached down in the wood and picked up that soul and picked the thing up and took it out, took it out the window and flew off. And the soul was screaming and woke him up. And he woke up and looked at his brother over there, and his brother was lying in that bedroll dead, lying like this. Mouth wide open. Somebody left this probably a dream. Uh, yeah, it was maybe just a dream, but it sure got a lot to it. It sure got a lot to it. What shall a man profit if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You're going to be amazed how quick you got there, and when you get there, you're going to be amazed how fast that thing was. You never thought it could be that fast. And next, you're going to be amazed to find that place is filled with religious people. That's going to be a shock to you. 
You're going to get there and you're going to think, well, only the bank robbers and thieves and murderers and adulterers and whoremongers in here. The only people in here like, must be in here, people like Jim Jones. No, you're in for a shock. You're in for a shock. You're going to get there and find priests there. You're going to find bishops there. You're going to find archbishops there. You're going to find popes there. You're going to find evangelists there. You're going to find charismatic healers there. You say, oh, not that, Ruckman. Yeah, that. You say, I don't believe it. I didn't think you would. That's going to be one of your surprises. You're going to be surprised to step there and find a bunch of healing evangelists in there. And a bunch of folks that talk in tongues. And a bunch of cardinals, brother. And a bunch of popes. A bunch of bloody killers. But nobody knew about it. Religious folks, you find some nuns there. You say, Brother Ruckman, surely people like Mother Teresa. See, that's your problem. That's your problem. When you find there, you're going to find religious people there. And when you get there, not only going to be religious people there, but people who are good people. You know what Paul said about his own religion? He said, I count all things, talking about his own religion he had before he was saved, but dumb. But I might win Christ and be found him, having not my own righteousness, but the righteousness which is by faith. Now, you know what Paul called the, 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 the highest type? of religious obedience in the world. You know what he called it? He called it dumb. You know what the word means? No fact, sir, fellas told me out in Texas one time, if that stuff you're giving Ruckman is a lot of, a lot of BS, you know. You think I'd abide my religion, do you? Well, that's what God says about yours. I didn't write the book. <laughs> he said, the righteous, these things were righteous to me. I kind of but dumb that I might win Christ. Go and get upset at God. Don't you look at me like that, you bigoted, prejudiced, narrow-minded hypocrite, you. Get a child a book and read it. It says, don't, D, you, and you all updated, buddy. <laughs> this updated new Bible, you can understand. <laughs> don't you know? Don't you know? Don't you know, baby? You know what you're going to find? You're going to find that good people there. You never thought they'd be there, but they're going to be there. I talked with a Marine lieutenant downtown one time. I said, Lieutenant, I, I can't get those Navy ranks right. I never could get them right. I don't know, a lieutenant, commander, and a commander, and a petty officer, and a junk. But uh, uh, one of them things, you know, they got stripes on them or something. Anyway, I was talking to him about these things. And it's amazing how, how, how wise a young man gets when he gets so far away from home and his mom and daddy and preachers can't check on him, you know. It's amazing how intellectual they all get, you know. And I was talking to him about this matter, you know, and he was rejecting Christ, rejecting Christ, and Put things, put another thing off. He said, "Well, I'll tell you what, I think your 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 hell's just here on earth. Your heaven's here on earth, and your hell's on earth." He said, "I think my hell is right here." And I said, uh, "You got that wrong, partner." So what do you mean? I said, "There's water right down there in the bay, about 200 yards. There's no water in hell. Your hell couldn't be in Pensacola. In Pensacola, in time you want to get a drink, you turn the faucet, and get you a drink of water. You're not going to do it in hell." He said, well, I think God will give me something. No, God won't even share water in hell. That rich man in hell said, Sir Mathis, get the tip of his finger of water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. And the Lord said, nothing to him. Well, so I just believe that God is gracious and God will share his love. He won't even share water. He won't even share water when you get this place. You're going to be shocked. You're going to be surprised. You're going to be excited to find, find professing Christians, professing Christians in hell. You're going to get a shock. I was up here one time, this fellow, Oakfield Acres. Did you ever see this place? You come up here in this kind of place, of the trailer courts back in there and a, and a beautiful brick home. You come up to Pilot Box. Go from the right-hand side as you drive north, from the east side. And there's a place there stretched out that I got in the Sunday property. You got about 50 acres back in there. You sold a part of it for a trailer court. The rest of it sitting there, and that stuff is worth about 30000 bucks an acre now. And one guy that ran that thing, he's dead now. I'm gone, but I talked to him. I, 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 I make it a habit when I come to a place, and I'm just beginning at Brentham. I make, I make a habit to come to a place like this to find the, the biggest, richest, wealthiest place in town. and just go up there by myself and bang on the door. So I drove up in that guy's place and banged the door, and he came to the door, and he was affable and friendly and opened the door and let me in, come in and talk with him. He was a merchant marine. Made a fortune. I guess I don't know what kind of made on his trip. He made a fortune. He bought that. He got everything there in that uh, uh, pile of there, I guess, for 
Oh, maybe uh, maybe that thing is 10 acres long and uh, 15 acres deep. And I sat down and talked with him. He was he was uh, he's open. I couldn't get anywhere with him. You know what he say? Well, he say, preacher, I've been overseas and I've spent a lot of time in Japan, and India, and I've been over there in Indochina and Cambodia and Vietnam. He said, I've been around the world. I've traveled around the world all my life. And he said, I just simply believe that God wouldn't send these people to hell. Never had a chance. I don't mean, I just don't believe what you're saying about an unsaved man going to hell. He said, I know people over there in, uh, in Africa and Asia where I've been that never heard the gospel. What you preach, what you say is true. And he said, don't you think those Hindus over there and those Buddhists and those Brahmas are just as right as you are? What makes you think you're right and they're wrong? And I talked to that fellow and talked to that fellow and talked to that fellow. I never got anywhere with him. And, and his thing was, uh, well, preacher, I don't smoke. And he didn't. And he said, I don't drink. He said the crowd I hang out was a rough crowd. I knew it was Merchant Marine, some of the roughest in the world. And he said, I, I'm, I'm a good man. I haven't done anything wrong. Uh huh. You know what you're going to find when you get to hell? You're going to find there's nothing that doeth good, no, not one. You're going to find all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. You'll find there's another just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That's what you're going to find out. You say, well, I, I'd, I'd be surprised to find that out. Yeah, you will be. You will be. That's very true. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about surprises when you get to hell. You're going to surprise me find good people there. I talked to a fellow here in town a couple of days ago, and I've talked to him four or five times before. And this time, instead of taking time to talk to him, I just busted right into him. And I got a hold of him, and I said, Peter, and I said, you been to church yet? And he said, no, I've not, I've not been to church. He was a German. And I said, uh, when are you going to go to church? How long have you been in this country? You've been in this country about 12, 15 years. You've been in this country 12 or 15 years and never been inside a Baptist church. What do you know about anything, fella? This fellow's so smart there, are you? never been around. If you'd have been in a Baptist church, you'd have been around. I mean, I went, I went to a Baptist church when I was 27 years old. It was a new experience to me, man. At 27 with a college education. This fellow don't even have a college education. He said, no, I, I, I haven't been there. I said, why not? He said, I don't like people to tell me I'm bad because I'm not bad. I'm a good man. I said, nothing wrong. He said, no, nothing wrong with me. You don't have any bad thoughts, and I don't have any bad thoughts. So I said, you're a better man than I am going to be in. I said, if I had to give account for everything I thought in the last 24 hours, I'd go to hell like a bullet. And he said, oh, no, no, you wouldn't. You, uh, they always try to, when they talk about that, they're always trying to make themselves feel good. You know what I mean? You won't talk me out of conviction, boy. I know my sins. They're my personal property. <laughs> I take great pride in the fact they're mine. <laughs> And they're not yours. I say, why do you do that? Because my sin is the reason I got saved. Christ died for my sins. If I didn't know how many sins, I'd never come to Christ. I know I got them, boy. Don't, don't pull my leg. And he said, well, I never done anything wrong. I said, well, all the sin comes short of the Lord of God. Oh, I'm a good man. I'm a good man. I don't see what's right but going to church. You just come home feeling bad. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Well, that poor critter, he was just as proud as the devil himself. That's what damns a man is pride. I mean, I'm a good man. The Lord says you're not. I am. No, you ain't. Well, that's just your opinion. No, that's just a fact. <laughs> you say, well, that's just the way you look at it. I ain't looking anywhere. That's what God said. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. There's not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Every man, every man, every man. Every man at his best state is altogether vanity. I don't think anything. That's just the truth. I don't particularly even like that truth. <laughs> if I wrote that book, I'd change that. Every man except Pete Luckman at his best state is altogether vanity. Well, you know, men didn't write the Bible because it uh, puts man down. When you hear a man say, I believe in man, people like to hear that. You know who likes to hear that? People that believe in themselves. All these humanists, you know what they are? They're just egotistical boobs. They're all stuck in themselves. I believe in man. Now, if you believe in yourself, you like to hear that talk, don't you? Because you're a man. I believe in man. Man is the measure of all things. These humanists all like to hear that stuff, you know. You know why they do? Because they're men. They're stuck in themselves. You never had a humanist in your life who was an egomaniac. I believe in man. 
Well, you're going to find good people there in hell. You're going to be filled with them. And listen, when that time comes when you get there, you're going to find good people trying to fix the blame, going to try to find out why they're there, and they won't be able to fix the blame. If you go to hell, let me ask you something. Who will you blame when you get there? I mean, you don't blame yourself. You're good. You don't blame yourself for anything. You're a good fellow, aren't you? When you get to hell, he's going to blame you. You don't blame me. You can't blame the preacher. He wants you to go to hell. You can't blame the church. The body of Christ didn't want you to go to hell. Who are you going to blame? You going to blame God? Send his son to die for you? How are you going to blame God? You can't blame God. Boy, you folks that are good folks, you sure going to be in a mess, ain't you? Who are you going to blame? Blame your family? Your family don't want you to go to hell. Who are you going to blame? Your friends? Your friends don't want you to go to hell. Listen, your friends and your family and the church and the preachers, they wouldn't want you to go to hell. God wouldn't want you to go to hell. Christ would Who wants you to go to hell anyway? Besides the devil. And he can't force you. He can't force you. Who are you going to blame when you get there? I'm a good fellow, but what are you doing burning down there if you're such a good guy? You get to hell, you know what you're going to be surprised to find? You're going to be find, uh, surprised to find that good folks there. They're good folks there. Of course, there's some, be some scoundrels there. There'll be some out and out bad fellows. You think because you're not one of them, you're all right. That's that fellow, that's what call that fellow Peterson. He thinks he's all right because he's not as rotten as some of the people he's read about. Read about the rotten folks, you think you're all right. Why don't you read about Jesus Christ and see how you stack up with him? Years ago in this country, there was a man named Black Jack Ketchum. Black Jack Jack Ketchum was born in 1866 and was hung in 1901. And Jack Black Ketchum has always been my uh, my uh, idea of a perfect bad man. He was the ideal bad man. He didn't have a hypocritical bone in his body, boy, that fellow. He was arrested for murder and train robbery. And to this day, nobody knows if he was really guilty of train robbery. Or, or murder. They knew he was guilty of train robbery. Nobody could prove that he actually murdered somebody, but he did murder a couple of them. And of course, right at the end, he pretended like he hadn't, but he's just the kind of a guy that do it. <laughs> anyway, they hung him. They hung that old boy and got him up there, and, uh, and he, they asked him before they hung him. They said, do you want to have a chaplain? He said, no, I don't want a blanket blank chaplain. I don't want to talk to any chaplain about nothing. And they said, what's your last request before you die? He said, my last request, I want to have somebody play a fiddle when I swing out. <laughs> I put him a jig in the fiddle while he, while he, he ran up the steps. He gets hung. He ran up them. And he asked for, he said, he, when he went up the steps, he got the top of the steps and said, what did you put this stockade around here for? They said, that keeps spectators from seeing this hanging. He said, take it down. Let him see a fellow get hung that never killed a man in his life. And he got up there and then he said, he said, okay, boys, let her rip. I'll be in hell for you. Let her rip. I'll be in hell for you. Eat breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Better rip, boys. I'll be the hell for a wham. They slammed that thing and had the weights on it wrong and tore the head loose from the torso. What a mess, man. You talk about a character. There's one. Let her rip. It rip, boy. That thing came down. The weights went the wrong way. <laughs> the head hanging up there and the torso flapped on through it. That's a bad man. He's a bad cat, boy. <laughs> Died a bad death. And some of you folks think, well, I'm not like that. What are you doing in that kind of company in hell? If you're not like that. Is that kind of company for a good man to keep? There must be something awfully wrong with you. We just don't know about. Because that's where God puts them. There is no difference. There is no difference. For all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. All right, that is no. You're going to be, you're going to be shocked and amazed and surprised at the fact that the torment never ends. You would have sworn that it ended after a while. And after you burn for 20 million years, you're going to say, my God, is this going to go on forever? And it's going to go on forever. You know what you forgot? You forgot that when you sin against God, you sin against somebody that lives forever. You keep thinking about sin in a human context like a humanist. You keep thinking like these humanist things. That, you know, man is just, well, man's a good man, and God wouldn't do a thing like that. And why would God do a thing like that? I mean, after all, I wouldn't do a thing like that. So God wouldn't do a thing. But you're not God. And God lives forever. Now, if you sin against me, you could pay for it in a few years. I mean, 60, 70, 80 at the most. I'm not going to live that long. 
But what are you going to do when you sin against God? Job says, if a man sin against God, who's going to speak for him? Who's going to speak up for him? Nobody can speak up for him. You sin against God, you sin against the being that lives forever. And if you're going to pay for your sin, you know what you're going to do? You're going to pay forever and ever and ever and ever. And that's going to be a shock to you. You know what you're going to be shocked at? You're going to get in hell and say, where's the sound of music? No music. Where's the sound of laughter? No laughter. Where's the sound of little children? No little children. Uh, let me tell you something. You get in a place where there's no music and no laughter and no little children, you're in tough grounds. You take an infantry combat, there's none of that. But occasionally you hear a fellow laugh. They'll make up jokes. I mean, they get between rest periods and rest areas. You hear a guy pull out a harmonica or a, something play on it. Vietnam, pick up a shortwave station, pick up some music. You won't hear. You get in here, you'll never get out. You'll get a surprise. The surprise you're going to get is it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. Folks talk about, well, that this is love, love, love. You don't know what you're talking about. That Bible says God is love. You say, well, if God is love, why do you do things like that? Because there come a time when God won't fool the fellow. There comes a time when you pray and God don't hear the prayer. You know what the rich man said over there in the, in the, in the, in the Luke chapter 16? He got praying. Father Abraham, send my others, dip, dip this finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I know what he said when he's up in this earth. He said, I won't pray. You can't get me to pray. I ain't going to pray. Down there in hell, he changed his mind. But when he got down there, it was too late. You say, Ruffman, it's never too late. If not, turn to Lamentations, chapter 3. Lamentations, chapter 3. There'll be a time you lift up your head to God and say, Oh, God, this, and oh, God, that, and oh, God, the thing, and the Lord won't pay more attention to you if you weren't even there. Lamentations, chapter 3. Lamentations, chapter 3, the Lord told old uh, Jeremiah one time, Don't lift up your hand, don't pray for this people, and when they cry, I won't hear. Lamentations, chapter 3. I'll give you a little time to read there tonight. We'll just stop preaching for a while. Give you a little time to read. Get you some education. Read verse 1 to verse 8. Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 1 to verse 8. Lamentations chapter 3. Verse 1 to verse 8. Read it. That's Scripture. Some you never saw that before in your life. Now look at verse 8. You know what that is? That's a picture fell in hell. And he's praying. And he's shouting. And he's crying. What God's doing? He's ignoring it. Look at verse 8, Lamentation 3 8. Cry and shout, shuts the prayer out. Doesn't get answered. What's going to be some of you folks? It's going to be a shock. You're going to be surprised to get in a place where you cry out to God for help and see the torture and misery and weeping and wailing and gnashing teeth around you. You'll say, surely if there's any God, if there was any God at all, he put an end to this. And he goes right on, and right on, and right on, and right on. You ever start to think about what you're going to be like after you spent 10 million years in hell? You folks talk about love and believe in love, and look, God wouldn't do this, and God wouldn't do that. What's going to happen to you after you've been there about 10 million years? You've been down that fire like that, looking up there. And through the eye of faith, you'll be seeing New Jerusalem floating over your head, and hear the sound of the song of the redeemed drifting down. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the Lord. Die them and crown him Lord of all. You'll be down there saying, God, I hate you for being here. I hate you and I hate myself for being here. And I hate these people here. And I hate this place. And I hate you because you had your way and I didn't have my way. And I wanted to have my way. And I hate, I hate, I hate you. That's how you lovely people are going to wind up. Ruckman doesn't have enough love in his preaching. Isaiah said, uh, fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. God is love. Our God's a consuming fire. He prayed then. He prayed then. Then it's, then it's going to come to sharing a love. It's not even sharing water. 
Brother Frederick up there in uh, Noah's Church in, uh, in Livonia, Michigan, had an uncle. Man lived a wicked life most of his life, got up in years, was confined in old folks' home, got up there and was slowly dying. And Frederick went around to him a couple of times, talked to him about his soul, got nowhere. And finally one day he said to his uncle, he said, uh, don't you believe in hell? He said, no, I don't believe in hell. And he said, well, if I left you a Bible, you read it through one time, then tell me how you feel about it. He said, yeah, i got time to read it. I guess I'll read it. So Frederick gave him the Bible. It took him about a year almost to read the thing through. And Frederick went by to see him one day and said, have you read it through yet? He said, I, yeah, I read it through. I read it through. What do you think about it? You believe there's a hell now? Well, he said, the Bible says there's a hell. He says, well, if there is, are you going there? He said, yeah, I guess I'm going there. And Frederick said, well, uh, what are you going to do about it? What that old fellow said, he said, well, I guess I'll just have to go to hell and take my punishment like a man. No, you won't. Nobody takes third-degree burns over 100% of their body like a man after they've been burning for 10, 10 years or 10 days. Or ten hours. They put you down the deep riding bath there and rip the skin off you and then try to get it to grow back on you and they shoot you full of morphine to keep from screaming and driving everybody in the bath with them. That's what they do. The fellow said to me one time, he said, Ruckman, he said, I know why you got saved. He said, You're just a coward. He said, You got saved because you're afraid of going to hell. I said, <laughs> You got my number, brother. That's just exactly why I got saved. You're not going to catch me fooling around with third-degree burns 10 million years at a time. No way, brother. So it's grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear to leave. Don't talk about amazing grace, how sweet the sound that love, if you don't sing the second standard. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. No love to it, boy. And grace my fear to leave. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. One time a fellow over in India had a dream. He went to a man who could interpret dreams and said, uh, can you interpret my dream? And he said, well, I can try. And the man said, well, I had a terrible dream. He said, I dreamt that uh, a tiger was chasing me. And he said, that tiger chased me, and I ran and ran that tiger and, and couldn't find any way out. And see, I was going to find any way out. And he said, I came to a cliff, and that tiger was pressing me hard and was about to jump on me as I got near the cliff. And he said, I thought I was doomed. He said, I looked below uh, over the cliff, and he saw, saw at the bottom of that cliff, he said, I saw a marsh down there, and a bunch of alligators were down in the marsh. And he said, I didn't know what to do. I figured I'd had it, didn't know what to do. But he said, I suddenly looked down there, and he said, I noticed there was a rope tied right up there where I was standing, and it hung down about 30 feet off the cliff. And he said, I quickly shinned down that rope and hung on there to that rope, and then I got a little knot in that rope and tied around myself. And the tiger came up there, and he couldn't come and get me, and I was above the crocodiles. They were about 40 feet below me, and I was safe. And then he said, I noticed that some rats came along. And they crawled out and into that rope, and they began to gnaw on that rope. And he said, what is that? And the seer said, well, he said, I'll tell you what. He says, the tiger is your conscience. And he said, that rope is your life. And those rats are the hours and days and weeks and months gnawing away at the rope. And he said, down there below where those crocodiles are, he said, that's the judgment that's waiting. Now, that's it. Take no thought for the future. The present is all that thou hast. The future will soon be the present, and the present will soon be the past. All you got right now. You're sitting here right now. You know what's happening right now? The old rats are on at the roof. And the judgment's waiting right below you. And you won't get out of it. You won't miss it. It is the point of man once to die and after this, the judgment. Christ says, weeping, wailing, gnash your teeth. Christ says, throw the furnace of fire. Jesus Christ, not me. Don't get mad at me. Write Jesus a letter and tell him what a liar he is, what a hypocrite he is, however you want to do it. Don't you get upset with me. I'm just telling you what he said. He said, depart from you, curse an everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And when you get to hell, and some of you may make it, I hope not. But I, I've, I've never been to a congregation, I don't guess, with more than 200 people in it. There wasn't somebody there that just figured they're just smarter than I was, and so they didn't have to pay attention to what I said. 
I bet you've had people in this building came in here and Donovan couldn't tell them what to do. And I couldn't tell them what to do. Brother Mitchell couldn't tell them what to do. Brother John Mitchell. And Brother White couldn't tell them what to do. And Brother Noe couldn't tell them what to do. And Brother Harley Keck couldn't tell them what to do. Brother Sam Gitt couldn't tell them what to do. Nobody could tell them what to do. You have some kind of secret knowledge that makes you know something about God we don't know. So you wait and you wait and you wait and you wait and then you're there. And when you're there, get there, you're going to get a surprise. You're going to get five of them. I hope you never get them. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, bless your word tonight. May the Holy Spirit convict of sin, rights, and judgment. May nobody I've talked to tonight know what it's like to wind up where you said they're going to wind up. And you wouldn't have said they were going to wind up if they weren't going to wind up. You wouldn't have warned us about this place if it wasn't there. You wouldn't have gone out of your way to say these things and make yourself a target of human hatred and vilification if these things weren't true. And I pray in the name of Jesus Christ tonight, the soul that's nearest hell tonight in this building, you know where they're sitting, will we'll take, take, take fear of the, the right thing, God, and take courage for the right thing. And accept God's Son as a Savior tonight. And I pray in His name.